All right, my loyal listeners, here we go. We are wrapping up the sign of the beaver today, chapter 25. And that is our last read aloud for the year as well. Running out of time and, well, we've been running out of viewership as well. So those two or three people have been paying attention. I appreciate it. And pick up a good book. Read it to yourself. Read out loud in your room. Hear those voices. Give those characters character. All right, here we go. Chapter 25. Three days later, snow threatened again, and Matt gathered a pile of firewood to dry inside. He had just carried in his third armful when he heard the dog barking frantically a short distance away. Matt found him standing on the bank of the creek, his feet braced, the ridge of hair standing up along his back. Peering along the creek, Matt caught his breath. Something dark was moving along the frozen course of the stream, a huge shape too large to be an animal or even a moose. Then he saw it was a man dragging behind him some sort of sled. He didn't move like an Indian. As he watched, Matt made out, Matt made out a second, smaller shape just coming into sight around the bend of the creek. He did not dare to shout for fear they would vanish like ghosts. So who would he not want to disappear? You're right. He stood still, his heart pounding. Then finally, he began to run. Pa! He choked. Pa! Oh, I can't imagine that reunion, right? So long. His father flung down the pack he carried. His arms went around Matt and held fast, though he could not manage to speak a word. Then Matt saw his mother struggling to climb down from the sled. He bent and threw his arms around her. How small she seemed, even under the heavy cloak. Sarah came floundering through the snow in her father's footsteps and stood staring at him, her eyes bright under the wooden, a woolen hood. She wasn't the child he remembered. Awkwardly, he put his arms around her and gave her a hug. Then they were all talking at once, trying to be heard over the fierce clamor of the dog. Quiet, Matt shouted at him. It's my family. They've come. They're actually here. They pushed their way through the snow to the cabin, leaving the sled where it stood in the middle of the ice. Matt helped his mother over the doorstep. He could see she was scarcely able to stand, and he pulled a stool near the fire for her. She clung to him, her eyes on his face. Matt would hardly have recognized her as so thin and pale, with great shadows in her eyes. But those eyes were warm and shining, and her smile was as beautiful as he had remembered. I was bound we'd get here for Christmas, she panted. I couldn't have borne it to let Christmas go by. Oh, Matt, you're safe. It was the typhus, his father explained. We all took sick with it, and the fever was bad. It takes all the strength out of the body. Your ma got the worst... We ought to have waited longer till she was more fit, but she was dead set on starting. The river is most frozen shut. We had to wait at the trading post three weeks before anyone would risk carrying us. Then we had to get the sled made, but your ma, she kept pushing at us. She's a rare one, your ma. I had to, she said, thinking of you alone in this place. It wasn't so bad, Matt said stoutly. I wasn't alone all the time. I had the Indians. <gasps> Indians, his mother gasped. <gasps> Are there Indians hereabouts? Pa said there wouldn't be, Sarah exclaimed, wide-eyed. What are they like? They're gone now, Matt said, but they were my friends. Then he brought it out proudly. I had an Indian brother. From the way they stared. <laughs> oh, I can only imagine, right? They're probably like, <laughs> right? From the way they stared at him, he could see it was going to take a mighty lot of explaining before they could understand. Yeah, I believe that. He didn't suppose they ever would, truly. His father said nothing. He was looking soberly at the snowshoes propped against the wall at the bow hanging over the door where the rifle would have been or should have been. Everywhere he looked, Matt realized he must see something the Indians had given him or had taught him how to make for himself. However, his father seemed to think there was no time now for questions. We better unpack the sled, he said, before it starts to snow again. Matt sprang to help. 
There was one question he had not dared to ask till he and his father were alone. The baby? Did you leave it behind? His father ran a hand over his beard. His eyes were troubled. The little one only lived five days, he answered. It was a pitiful little thing. Would never have made this journey. Just don't say out to your ma. She still takes it hard. Didn't see that one coming, did you? Matt promised. He wished he had somehow been able. He wished he had somehow been able to hide the cradle before she noticed it. Standing in the snow, his father reached to put a hand on Matt's shoulder. You've done a grown man's job, son, he said. I'm right proud of you. Matt could not speak. It took his breath away to think that he might have gone with the Indians, that they might have come to an empty cabin and found that all his mother's fears had come true. He would never have heard the words his father had just spoken. This is how Atian had felt he knew when he had found his Manitou and became a hunter. As his father untied the bundles from the sledge, Matt lugged them into the cabin. Flour, molasses, a fine new kettle, warm, bright quilts, and thanks be, new boots for him, and a woolen jacket and breeches. He felt richer than Robinson Crusoe with all the plunder from that sunken ship. Then he noted that his father had had a new rifle, and presently he discovered, poking out from his mother's pack, his own old musket. He hadn't a doubt she had learned to use it, and would have too had her family been threatened. He suspected that even Sarah, so grown up now, wouldn't have feared to pull that trigger if there had been need of it. Well, there'd be no need more there'd be no more need of it now with two men to fend for them. Inside the cabin, Sarah was bustling capably about, unwrapping the pewter dishes, setting out the little whale oil lamp that had always stood on the table in Quincy. That's the funniest looking dog I ever saw, she said. It won't come near us. He's an Indian dog, Matt told her. He's suspicious of white folk. You wait, you'll get to like him. He couldn't get over how much older she looked, but still spunky. Her eyes were sparkling, and Matt suspected that for her, the long journey had just been an adventure. He should have made her a bow instead of a doll, and he would, too, the first chance he got. His mother had thrown off her cloak, and the fire had brought a bit of color into her cheeks. She was making a great show of coming home. If the cabin seemed rough and cramped after the pretty house she had left behind, she never let on for a moment. She went about admiring everything, the drying ears of corn, the strings of pumpkin, the fine new wooden bowls he had carved. All this food, she marveled, and I had been feared you were starving. He was thankful now for the times he had gone hungry to save what he could for their coming. There's jerky for supper, he told her. I try not to eat too much of it. You can make a pretty fair stew with that and a little pumpkin. Some salt would sure help if you brought any. As he started, as he started out again, his mother stopped him and put her hands on his shoulders. Wait a minute, she said. I just want to look at you. She had to tip her head back to do it. Meaning he's taller than her now, right? You look different, Matt. You're almost as tall as your pa. And awful thin. You're so brown I'd have taken you for an Indian. I almost was one, he said, giving her a quick hug to show he was joking. He hoped she never knew how true it was. Right, how close he was to deciding to go with Atien and his grandfather. We're going to have neighbors, she said happily as she set the new kettle over the fire. A man and his wife have a claim not five miles from here. They're staying at the trading post till spring. We plan to share a pair of oxen. They say three other families are coming too. They're going to set up a mill. For you know it will have a town here, maybe even a school for you children. Neighbors. That was a thought that would take some getting used to. Matt supposed he ought to be pleased. Yes, of course, he was pleased. It was just that he rather liked it as it was here in the forest. With all the gladness in him right now, he wouldn't think there'd be room for any other thought. But even now, with his family here, their voices filling the long silence with all his worries vanishing like smoke up the chimney, 
he suddenly thought of the Indians. He wished the Atien and his grandfather could know that he had been right to stay, that his father had come as he had promised them. But the old man had been right too. More white men were coming. There would be a town here in the land where the Indians had hunted the caribou and the beaver. If only he could be sure that the Indians had found a new hunting ground. Matt thrust his arms into his new jacket and went out again in the snow. Behind him, the cabin glowed, warm and filled with life. Already, steam was rising from the new kettle. He'd cooked one of his own special stews for them for supper, and he wouldn't have to eat it alone. They would all sit together around the table and bow their heads while his father asked the blessing, prayed. Then he would tell them about Atienne. And that's it. The sign of the beaver. Do you think Matt would have survived that long in the forest with the cabin without his family if he had never met the Native Americans? I don't think so. And I think because when he broke the fishing line, he wouldn't have known how to fix it and replace it well enough to catch fish again. And when his rifle was stolen and didn't have traps to set and learn how to do those, he could have starved to death. Most likely would have. Yeah, that's a tough one. I think this. I think the Native Americans showing the kindness they did were a, a huge, huge help to him. So, but a good ending, but sad. I'm sure you caught that. Not all his family survived, right? They lost that newborn child. Remember, that's why mom stayed back and dad came out with Matt. He was going to go back and get them once the child had been born. But, uh, the child passed after five days, sadly, and, and then it was getting late in the winter for them to come out. No one would even take them across the ice. And But mom's, mom pushed because she really wanted to get to Matt. And dad is struggling because he wants to get to Matt, but he wants to take care of his wife. She could have died from all that stress. <sighs> Life's not easy. But man, it was tough back then. People, people come together, right? People came together here. And people come together now in this time, right? So keep the faith, stay strong, stay safe, right? And uh, love on your family. Love on your family. It's who you've got. All right, love you guys. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.